Um, thank you very much, and thanks to Mike, actually, uh, for inviting me over. I've already met some of you in class today, um, so you'll hopefully be able to understand what I'm saying. Um, what I thought I'd do is, not only would I show you some work, I'd also sort of show you what it is to be a photographer in terms of the type of work that you're asked to do, how it works, and to give you an idea, really, of what it is like to be a, a commercial advertising photographer as well as doing fine artwork. So it is a bit of a mixture, as Mike says. Um, there we go. So this is, <clears throat> I'm going to start off with advertising work, actually, and show you this first. And then we'll move on into uh, to fine artwork. <clears throat> These were a series of three ads which were commissioned by Guinness um, in Ireland. They're based really within Irish mythology. <clears throat> Uh, and these, well, hurling is, a, is an Irish game which is played with a stick and a ball, so stick and a ball, really. Um, and it's, it's over 3,000 years old, uh, and the, the game has been played in various forms throughout the years. Um, it predates Christianity, uh, and it was originally played between villages. Um, the games used to last several hours or even days with hundreds of players. Now that's evolved right down now to um, a, a team sport, which is probably, there are two major uh, Irish sports, uh, Irish football and hurling. And hurling is only played by a certain number of people because it's a very fast game, it's a very athletic game. And this myth goes back to um, Cuculain, um, uh who was called Satanta, and he, he, he murders a guard or he kills a guard dog and he moves, he, he then has to become uh, the guard dog for, uh, or the guard for the man he, uh, whose dog it was he murdered. And again, I mean, Guinness are very clever with this. This isn't, this isn't really, these aren't my ideas. These are my photographs, but they're not my ideas. And Guinness have hooked into this and they use it. Um, I don't know if people really mind that because Guinness is also a long established Irish myth shall we say. So it's not really a bad, it's not really a bad marriage between the two. There were three in the series. Uh, this is the other one which is the, the Brown Bull of Cooley uh, and it was a, a raid by uh, Queen Maeve's men to try and steal this bull. Uh, and that, what we do with these shots really is um, there may be in this maybe four or five actual photographs which are put together um, and they're photographed in the Cooley is, a, is a, the Cooley Peninsula, which is an actual um, location in Ireland. So uh, whenever you're photographed, this was actually a golf course here. Uh, we did get the guys. They were all um, uh, various sports guys, really, or people who were PE teachers and this sort of thing. All of the, uh, the, the you can't really see it very well, but all of the costumes that they're wearing. Uh, my wife, who's sitting down there, uh, is a stylist, and she would have got all those from... Uh, from London mostly. The net, for instance, which was this massive rope net, had to be made specially for the shot. Uh, we photographed the guys there one morning. We photographed the bull uh, on a farm uh, quite close to where this is. The bull was again a prize bull, which was valued at 100,000 euro um, and lived in a, in a shed with seven cameras on him. Um, he was quite a star, the bull. Worked very well, I must say, but uh, didn't. Uh, so a lot of this sort of thing is really about combining, combining photography um, and working to brief. This is the last one. This is uh, the Giant's Causeway, which is a piece of land up in Northern Ireland. Very distinctive because of these octagonal basalt columns. And this is about um, Finn McCool. And this is a visiting, not a visiting, uh, an invading Scottish giant who, who, who comes to Ireland to try and invade. Again, the hurling is there. <clears throat> um, this guy was a, was a bodybuilder, um, and we did uh, sort of prosthetic uh, mouth and, well, almost complete face mask, really. Wig, again, he's dressed up. Um, he's photographed against a blue screen background. He was photographed at a separate location. We photographed the Giant's Causeway with a little bit of flash, just to give a little bit of shape to it. And uh, the day that we were there, there were no waves, so we had to go the next day and photograph again, um, just some waves. The sky is a separate sky. This piece of land is separate. We photographed lots of uh, splashes of water. Um, so all the time you're really building up 
uh, the photograph with, with the one intent to have it as one shot. So when, when you shoot everything, it really has to, it has to start to work as one shot and you have to consider it as one shot. <clears throat> so, I mean, professional practice, what does it really involve? I mean, these are the categories I have put together, really. Social photography, which are weddings, high street, editorial photography, which can cover almost anything, really, fashion, food, travel, uh, portraiture and lifestyle. Design group work, which is more annual reports. Not so much of that work about at the minute because everybody's in a recession and the guys just don't want to spend the money. And then finally, um, advertising. And again, there are people will, who will really specialise in every angle of advertising. So there will be guys who just shoot food, excuse me, just shoot still life, just do car photography, this sort of thing. <clears throat> I actually started out as an assistant um, in London. Um, I moved to London and I, I was an assistant to a car photographer for uh, three years there. And then I did freelance assisting with various uh, other photographers who did different, I, I sort of really wanted to see what it was all about, so I did work with a food photographer, um, a still lifer. I worked with uh, a guy who did a lot of people work. And as an assistant, <clears throat> I mean, what you're learning about, it's very different to what you would learn at college. It's really about learning technical, uh, technical work. Uh, come on in. Um, um, it's also learning about how the business works and how you, how you estimate for jobs. Uh, so it's a, really, it's a really good way to learn if you're interested in that sort of work. Um, advertising hierarchy, as it were. At the very top there's the client, which is Bank of Ireland. Um, the ad agency, uh, somebody who liaises between the two, which is the account executive. The art director. Now the art director really is the one who's responsible for the ideas that you'll see. Uh, so the client will come along and say, OK, we want to sell more Guinness, and we want to target our market at 25-year-olds or whatever. And they really work that out very, very accurately as to their target market. Then the art directors within the ad agencies draw lots and lots and lots of ideas. And this goes back and forth. It goes into research, where they stop people in the street and they say, if this was an ad, who do you think it's for? They have research groups that come in and they, they discuss the merits of, uh, of the product. <clears throat> so they're really spending, I mean, I've seen them spend uh, 100,000 euro in research alone just for a stills ad, just to get make sure that they, they, they hit the right nail on the head and they appeal to the right people. Uh, and once all that's done, then it comes to the photographer as a layout, which is normally just a drawing. And then I have to arrange all these people that you see down here uh, as required by the job. So assistants, retouchers, blah, 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 blah. Quite a lot of people. So that's really the, how it works in terms of the business end of things and how work comes to you. Um, OK, so <clears throat> this is just some more advertising work. So again, this was the, uh, the Irish Tourist Board. Golf is, is big, and um, Ireland is certainly a great destination for golfers. Um, a lot of golfers from the US actually come to Ireland, and they'll fly over and they'll try and play three or four courses before they fly back again. So um, this is a course down in County Clare on the west coast of Ireland. And again, this is made up of one shot for the sky, uh, one shot for this area, another shot for this area, and then individually the photographs of the people. Um, basically, they didn't really have the budget to send everybody over there. So I went over and photographed all the background material. Um, and then we went to a local golf course with the guys. <clears throat> he was a golf professional. Uh, and that's lit then with flash coming from here just to, to, to get the same lighting that's happening in the background. So you're always trying to merge, trying to think of it, even though you're shooting individual pieces. You're trying to think, what will the overall photograph look like? Will the lighting all be the same? Will the perspective be the same? Will the, uh, will the color be the same? Um, and in a way, this is the way it's gone now with advertising. There's, 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 there's not that much advertising work commissioned now that doesn't involve Photoshop uh, at some stage. I don't do the Photoshop work because that's done by guys in London who are very good. That's a very specialist area. Um, they get paid lots of money. I don't. Um, but you know, the Photoshop aspect of it now is, I would say, 50% really of, of many shoots. Um, 
more straightforward shoot. Again, this stadium was shot at night time <coughs> separately and then the guys were photographed just at their local, this is rugby, which is, uh, I don't know, do you know rugby here, do you? Yeah. Okay, so. Um, Here's another one that was photographed in, in a few sections. Um, the road here wasn't very wide, it was quite a narrow little road, so we had to photograph that side from here and then go over there and photograph this side. This, uh, this was actually for an energy company to do with uh, the idea of switching over your energy supplier. And, that, and they had this big switch sort of motif. So this was, we got one of these made up about four feet square out of uh, stainless steel that we would take with us everywhere. Um, this is in the south of Ireland, in the south coast. And really then, whenever you photograph the background, you just really quickly put that up on a stand. It's the same lighting, um, evening light, that, 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 that's affecting everything in the scene. So it picks up on that. And You know, there are certain things you can do in retouching and, and, and sort of CGI work, and some that you still have to do for real. And again, <clears throat> um, a sky that I shot elsewhere. So it's really, I mean, I feel a bit of a, you know, a cheat saying all this, but this is just the way it's required these days. Uh, this is for Jameson Whiskey. This was actually shot over in um, at Norfolk in Virginia. Um, they wanted to get a, uh, a cinema that actually had a front facing, uh, I'm not sure what you call them, canopy. A lot of cinemas have, uh, you know, canopies that come out like this, so you can read it from either side. Um, I went onto the internet and did a lot of research, and there are, um, sites here of uh, people who are very keen on cinemas and they have there's just millions of shots of cinemas all over the country and I just got in touch with the guys and said this is what we're doing and they said that's fine it was actually a privately owned cinema by this very wealthy man who had got George Lucas to come and put in the sound system and you went in and you could eat in there and they'd serve beer and and I don't know if cinemas are like that here normally but they certainly aren't in Ireland. Um, and again, uh, we just had one chair. Uh, and again, of course, Jemson sent the wrong chair for us. So we had to go and buy another chair. And, and that's been photographed all those uh, many sort of combinations and added in again and retouching. The name of the cinema was actually um, the Commodore Theatre uh, in that sort of style. So that was changed in 3D work to Jemison. But the actual lighting and, you know, I try and shoot. It, it, as much as possible for real, because there's no way around that. Um, this was part of the same job. This was shot over in um, by Salt Lake City at a a, a, snow, a, a resort there called Snowbird, um, which was uh, which was a lovely spot to be actually. And again, we had to get them to put out uh, snow machines overnight to actually fill this area with snow. Um, and this area had snow and then we, uh, we worked through it. So there really is, there really is quite a lot involved. The, the, the photographs always look very, hopefully they always look simple because if they look simple and you don't really question them, then we've, we've done our job correctly. If you sort of say, oh, but this is, that doesn't work because this perspective is different, then I haven't really done my job very well. <clears throat> um, obviously this is part of the same campaign for Jemison. This is, the, this is Dublin city centre, by the way. This is the River Liffey coming through here. Um, Dublin is based north and south around a, a river. Um, and this was used then around the world, really. They do a film festival every year. Uh, and this was one of the images that has been used all over the place and still is used. Actually, this is about maybe three or four years old. And it's still being used in, in Russia and in uh, Belgium, all sorts of places, really. Uh, so what I have with this, actually, I have a, a, a case study of this one, just to show you all what I photographed, how it was presented to me, really how it all comes together. <clears throat> um, so that's it, the three main players, um, the client, identify the market area uh, and approach the agency. They bring it into campaign, as it's called, so they'll have all the ideas, and then I have to do the photograph, really. And this is how you spell realise, uh, not with a Z. <clears throat> Um, so that's the drawing I got from the ad agency um, uh, and they say okay and they literally come and phone you up and say I'm just going to email you something and this comes over and they go that's what we want you to photograph and you really do spend the first sort of half hour scratching your head 
thinking, I have no idea how to do this. Because it seems simple, but to actually pull it off in a way that looks compelling and real, as real as big chairs walking up the river Liffey can be, uh, you do have to sit down and think quite a lot <coughs> about what you're going to do. So that's the main shot again, I think. Uh, and what I would do normally is I would talk to the, all the different people who are involved with this. So the, the retouching obviously is a big part of this shot. I would talk to them, I'd say I want to do it at, uh, at, at early morning as it was. Um, I want the sky to have certain colours. I, um, I, I talk to them about their input, about what elements that they might require. Um, and really you, you do meet, and with the art director, you meet together. You talk about, um, as I put here, uh, perspective. So you're, even your choice of lens you said at the very start, and that's it. You, you can't really start changing it too much. The lighting, the overall color. <clears throat> so this is the original photography. Now I do show all my advertising work digitally because of speed. Um, so this is early uh, one morning, about four o'clock in the morning. Just uh, w uh, th all the, the red lights are cars, all the, the, the river is lit, and there are these lights underneath the, the bridge. Um, and these will be all raw files. And again, we just give the raw, raw files to the retouchers so they can lighten and darken areas as they need to, as opposed to me giving them a final file. A little bit more on the left-hand side, and then a little bit more on the right-hand side. Um, and again, they'll just, they'll just cut the, the, the photograph here, put this bit on, the other bit gets put on here. <clears throat> I often find that if you shoot with a standard lens, um, and you add bits, it works better than shooting with a wide angle lens uh, because you get distortion. And I know that there's software now that can correct all that distortion, um, but I always still think it's easier just to have a standard lens and join the pictures together. Uh, sorry, there we go. And then the big chairs. Okay, this is in the studio. There we are with these chairs. Um, uh, underlit because a lot of the light on the street was coming up from, from street lamps. So kind of under it, but again, overall quite flat in terms of lighting, just to keep as much detail and to capture as much detail as possible. And we shot these from a million different angles, really. There's Johnny, my assistant, going, hmm, another chair. <laughs> and we went through it, and we went through it. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then we changed the angle. And we went through it. And we just literally rotated it. And we did, I think we did about 60 different variations of angle. Just as when we came to put it together, we, we knew we'd have the chair that was we going to slot in there. Um, then this is the sky that was used. Again, this is three parts from a standard lens, just turned vertically, so centre and two sides. Um, there's a special area in Ireland that go and shoot uh, skies, which is just outside of Dublin, which is um, the Hill of Tara, actually, which is where the the High Kings of Ireland are buried, but you can. There's a complete 360. You're quite up on a hill, complete 360 of uh, of no horizon line except this. So it's a really good spot to spend an afternoon uh, sleeping and shooting skies. Uh, and then just some various elements. This is a, this is a, a modern um, for the millennium. This was put into Dublin. This spike, uh, and it's a, again, it's a recognisable landmark within Dublin. <coughs> This section is just a different section entirely of some houses or some the, the edge of the river. I'll show you what that is for in just a minute. Um, so that is the complete picture again. And this is really how it goes together. <coughs> oh, sorry. One last thing. Just over here and in here where the, the, the wall has been broken away, uh, we got a little model made up out of polystyrene. Um, and all the bricks, all the stonework was measured to its dimensions uh, so that we knew it would, it would sort of cut in fairly easily. Uh, quite difficult to do in real life. And again, that's lit with a bit of yellow light. Um, some trees and then some boulders. So all these we taken and cut out and used as little bits to just to dress the set, really. So Taylor James were the company that did the retouching uh, and they're based in London. So it goes together like this, really. So that's the, again, it's not great quality, this, but you get the idea. That's the central piece. Two bits are added on either side. Um, the skyline there is being cleaned up, and the buildings are being moved around a little bit at that point. Um, 
So the new sky is put in behind everything then. Uh, the left hand side is cleaned up along here. I think there were a couple of people sleeping on the benches here. <laughs> so they didn't make it, I'm afraid. Um, and then a little bit more of a skyline put in behind this building. Uh, first chair put into position. This is why it's so critical to know what your angles are because that's how it goes in and that's it. It has to be really much uh, in perspective. So that's cut out. Mm. A little bit of tonal work is, is put onto it there. Uh, water splash there, the broken wall is put in and the stones are falling. Um, the reflection in the water is put in at that stage. Where did you get the splash from? They had splashes on file, <laughs> <laughs> which was great. You know, otherwise we would just go to a lake and chuck in stones and just photograph whatever. But they had some on file. Um, second chair going in there, and again, this has all been this has all been worked out beforehand as to the position of the chairs, the size they'll be, so that when we work it back, it all goes in correctly in perspective. Uh, in that one, the barrier here is just deformed a little bit. And again, the reflection is added in there. There's the next chair. Now that is where the trees are bent over. Um, and that is where that other little, the other section of building was added in behind. Because you just couldn't get a clear view of that. And then again, retouching that little pontoon is pushed down into the water to give it a little bit of a disturbed pattern around there. <coughs> um, fourth chair with its reflection. Fifth chair. Sixth chair, seventh chair, sixth chair. So uh, the wall on the right-hand side then is added at that stage. So that's that broken away. Even though it doesn't, you know, it, it mightn't quite match what we photograph, but they take elements of it and move it around and push it together just so it, it looks correct. Uh, but again, you have to provide all that sort of raw information. So that was sixth chair. Um, this building's made taller. Um, the sky behind here has been brought down because this they wanted this to stand out a little bit more. And that's quite a famous building in Dublin. <coughs> uh, and then the shadow detail here underneath has been increased, so it's quite dark. That's been brought up as well, really. Uh, then this is just playing with the sky, putting in a, a nice little bit of colour into the sky. Uh, and then this is sort of overall uh, tonal and colour work, again with the, the chairs. This is, all, this is all done in layers in Photoshop. I mean, th these guys just use Photoshop like everybody else. So everything can be changed back and forth, made brighter, made darker, made greener, made more cyan, whatever it might be. Um, that's a little bit of dust added in. Uh, again, that's just Photoshop, uh, sort of, I think it's with a spray, but it just adds a little bit of atmosphere. Um, and there we are. And then at the very last minute, the client said, oh, yes, that's great. But the green is quite, quite dark, and we like our green to be a certain color. And they have a Pantone reference for the green. So we thought, mm -hmm. and, and then we thought, let's put in a couple of helicopters that can shine on to these. And that will just bring that green out forward. And people there, uh, and the client's very happy. And I quite like the helicopters, actually. So. And that's the final shot. Are you directing these? moves that the Photoshop people were yeah. making? What we would do is we'd, we'd, we'd arrange, I'd work out how to shoot it and what all the, the various elements would be. Mm -hmm. I shoot it and then I would go over to London and sit in a little dark room with a big screen with the retoucher and say, okay, after they've done all the cutout work and all the initial work, this bit goes in here and that bit goes in there. And normally the art director from the ad agency would be there as well. Um, and we'd, we'd, the three of us would work on it together. Um, and move How things around. Uh, a retouch on that would be probably about maybe a week uh, to sort of seven days, that sort of thing really. Um, and then at the very end, the client gets invited over and they go, -da, there we are. And you hope and pray that you haven't wasted all their money really, you know. Because <laughs> it's, it's not a cheap, it's not a cheap, uh, you're into tens of thousands really at this stage um, and on up from there. Um, we've seen that, haven't we? Okay, this is a different one. This is another case study for this. is for Bank of Ireland. Um, same sort of thing. Um, three players, blah, blah, blah. And that commissioning procedure. Oh, this is the commissioning procedure. Yeah, okay. 
So the artists agree on the execution, on the, on the picture they want to do. They approach maybe two or three photographers. Everybody puts in a quote. Sometimes it's the lowest figure. Sometimes it's whoever is more appropriate to the job. Um, one, three, five. Very good. Um, the photographer works out how to do it, his approach, the service he needs, the overall look, feel of the shot, how long it will take. And sometimes you have to write what's called a treatment document, which is a, a document to say how you're going to do it, how it will look, and you put in references as to uh, just so as the client thinks this guy's trustworthy. <laughs> uh, okay, you provide an estimate, that's passed. Price something goes, yeah. Pre production starts. <clears throat> if there are models involved, we do casting in studios for models. Um, all this must be agreed by the client, the shoot, and then the post production, and then the final FTP transfer to the client. Um, is it getting very warm in here for everybody? Should we turn the air on, or is it just me? Yeah, maybe you could. It's just um, somewhere over there. But you'll have to speak louder then. I know. <laughs> You're an old deaf man. Yeah. Well, let's get it over quick. Okay, so here's another. <clears throat> Here's another layout from an art director. Again, this was rugby. Rugby is a big sport in Ireland. It's one of the few sports that Ireland can play at internationally and be quite good. So everybody, this is uh, for a bank, Bank of Ireland. Everybody wants to sponsor the rugby team and be part of that. Uh, this was a, there were four shots in total with this, and it was to do with uh, the landscape and, and rugby players. So obviously from this earth, a force erupts. Um, there are four provinces in Ireland, which uh, and one there was one for each province. <clears throat> um, and again, uh, this is for Ulster, which is uh, sort of Northern Ireland, really. Again, at the start, you decide, OK, the light, I want to come from this direction. So everything has to be lit this way, the background, the players, this background. You make all those decisions at the very start. Um, there we go. Uh, and then you stick with that. Again, you can't really, you can't really move from that too much. Uh, so in this case, I thought, OK, like coming from here and from here, and that's it. It's almost as simple as that, but it has to, it has to work together, really. So here's the original photography. Um, yeah, <laughs> very glamorous, guys. So these are the, uh, the, the professional rugby players. Um, again, we went up to where they, where they train, and we photographed them up there. We had to photograph him separately, just so we could move him around uh, behind the other two guys. Um, there's a little bit of video here. So there we are. Um, and basically what you're trying to do is always just get them into position, talk to them and make sure they have the right sort of expressions when you photograph them. And you'll see here every time they come forward, the flash goes off and that. Um, the other reason for doing it this way was uh, I was photographing from over this side and we had a little camera. Um, I know it's... Uh, it's bizarre by itself. Really. <laughs> um, he's taking it very seriously, though, when you look. Uh, <clears throat> we did 3D work on this, and with 3D work, you normally have to have uh, two views, one at 90 degrees to the other, so that if you're going to do a 3D of his face, you see this dimension, and then coming from here, you see the, the, the depth, as it were. <clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> so, um, so that was just shot with a, a Canon 5D from this direction and then they can take the frame just before or just after the flash and they know that's pretty much going to match the frame that you've taken from the side. Uh, and then what you do is you use what's called a chrome ball which is just literally um, a ball this size. You can buy it from a garden centre for 20 euro. Photograph that and that actually then reflects all the lights that you're using to light the shot. And then they use this, they actually map this ball into a computer program. Um, so whenever they put anything into the shot, they can say main light source here, secondary light source here, third light source here. I give them all the ratios of the power of the lights. So this one's stronger, this one's weaker. They map all that in and then, then they can wrap it into the 3D. Uh, so the software is just, I mean, most car photography these days is done this way, really. <clears throat> um, where they just go out into a nice location and photograph the ball and photograph the background. And then the car manufacturers supply a 3D or a wire diagram of the car, which they then rotate and whichever angle you want, put color onto it. And then this records the entire reflections that might be in the side of the car. 
and that then is mapped back into the sides of the cars. So, uh, and really most of the car shots you'll see in, in magazines these days are 3D, they're not, they're not real cars. Um, so here's the background, this is Belfast. <clears throat> The two cranes here are very distinctive and, that, and that really show the Belfast skyline. This is where the Titanic was built, which is big this week, really. Um, so again, two halves, standard lens, one side and the other, light coming from this direction, really. Um, then for the foreground, this is an area down in the, um, on the west coast of Ireland, which is just a lovely sort of foreground. It's, it's got texture, it's got a little stream. Uh, not really too much to interfere, so we're, we're photographing that and cutting it around about here, just for this section. <clears throat> this is the glamorous bit, we had to photograph it from helicopter. Um, so it was, we fly, flew down there and funnily enough that piece of land was actually owned um, by a man who lives in America and because we were landing the helicopter onto the ground, we had to get his permission to, to photograph it. Um, so there are all these calls back and forth. To, I don't know where in America, but imagine you know living over here and saying this is my part of Ireland. And everybody going wow, but there's nothing there really. Um, it's not quite the same in America. I believe if you're using a piece of land or a building for advertising, you have to get permission from the uh, whoever owns that building um, as a copyright issue. I don't know if. Um, um, in Ireland, you don't. As long as you're on, 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 on public land, uh, you don't have to get permission. Um, so if there was a road and you took the picture from the road... That's perfectly fine. Yeah. <coughs> mm. um, and then we went uh, on the helicopter. These are the Iron Islands, um, which are off the west coast of Ireland. And again, this is to photograph <coughs> really all of the, the bits that go into the, the, uh, into the ravine, really. And again, we had to photograph this at a certain time of day, so the light's coming this way and it's going to match into the final photograph. I mean, it's also lovely going around the, the islands, really photographing. Uh, this faces out onto the west coast, to the Atlantic, so they really are beaten. You can see big blocks have fallen off, beaten by the seas uh, every winter, really. It is, it does happen. <clears throat> One of the classic things actually is always in winter, you get drawings from the ad agency um, and the, the trees have leaves on them. <laughs> and you go, but we've got to wait a few months here before, uh, sometimes they're retouched on. Um, there are pre-production meetings normally with the client and we talk about all these issues and sometimes things are changed or moved to accommodate that. But really um, clients these days believe that Photoshop can do everything and they don't really they're not really interested in um, so you have to get as close as you can and then kind of fudge it a little bit really you know um, so there we are in other uh, extraordinary landscapes in themselves actually with, with big boulders and um, we also went into a quarry uh, just to get these sort of um, those all those sea cliffs you know all this is quite quite old a lot of vegetation a lot of staining from, from things. So we also went into a quarry and just photographed some more freshly exposed pieces of, of rock. And again, just to get all these different textures and the layers and things. So a few of those. Um, the retouching house was Saddington Baines, um, who are also in London. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. So this is basically then the background with the sky merging in to that nice piece of foreground that we shot. And then we just do a rough idea of where the ravine is going to be, where the players will be. <clears throat> and the players are put in there. So again, it's all working to scale. It's all working to the same height. So I, we worked out that we had to be about 50 feet above the land to get the same perspective as we had for the guys and then for the background to work. Uh, 3D model was made at this stage by, the, by Saddington Baines. The beauty of the 3D, you'll see he's actually facing a little bit more this way um, than he would have been in the original shot because we just felt that that wasn't quite, it should be coming out of the picture more than going across the picture. So you can shift it around in 3D and play with it quite a lot. Um, 
and this is it slowly being built up. 3D is quite a slow process. It's not great process for many things. Organic matter, I don't think, works so well. Uh, cars and things, which are a very distinct shape, do. So again, just working this up. Today, I wanted to, uh, these guys to look as though they were made from rock, but they were still moving, <coughs> which was curious. So there's more of the 3D model, and they're starting to work out 3D boulders falling down. And you can see again, I mean, there's the, it's all done within the one frame, so it'll actually hold. They're now starting to put on the lighting. <coughs> uh, and then putting it into the, the background, putting some detail. Um, even though uh, we did a lot of 3D work on this, it's more in their bodies, it's more in this area. These are still the photographs, really. Uh, worked into the 3D, so it's a combination of both going on there. More detail going in, a bit of colour work. And there we are, that was the final ad. <clears throat> so again, and that's not going. So this is lovely and everybody's very happy. Uh, and this is, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the history of Northern Ireland and the Troubles and somebody at the bank said, oh no, this, this can't be right because this looks like it's dividing two communities and pushing Northern Ireland apart. <laughs> After we'd spent all of the time doing this. Uh, and we were saying, no, 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 nobody sees it that way anymore. That's like years ago. <laughs> and they're saying, oh, but we can't take that risk. So <clears throat> we had to go and reshoot elements, really. What they wanted to do was to make sure all this action was contained within a playing field. Um, so again, we go up there, we photograph the stands, the centre pit, the other stands. They go together. <clears throat> then I go up again, photograph the crowds. Crowd scenes are really difficult to get because it just involves so many people. So you really got to go there when the match is happening and photograph during the match. More crowds. Um, and then the art director sort of did this. This is a different stadium, just to give the client an idea of how it would finally look. Made lots of notes, there's a new crop here. And again, these are a set of instructions that will come through really as to what, what they want to change and what we want to do. Uh, the old stadium goes in. They wanted to curve this. I mean, I quite like this curving effect on the, on the stands. It just gives it a little bit of perspective. <clears throat> uh, different sky. So then back to the main file. Uh, that is my favourite shot of the whole thing because it has this lovely sort of depth to it down here and it really has this dropping down. But that's the master file. And what they'll do is um, for billboards, <laughs> billboards tend to be double square size, so that'll come out like this. There are other shapes that are sort of this shape. Um, there are other ones which are really long and thin. So you do one big master file really that everything can be taken from that <clears throat> and that remains the same then. And that was their, their final shot. Um, I still prefer this by far, but... So do you get paid for the revisions and all yeah. that? Yeah. You renegotiate yeah. from the ground up. Uh, so here's some more, more work. Um, some of this is more retouching than others. Again, this is for Guinness. Uh, just the sky really put into that. And this is lit from above. Um, this was a good job. Um, this was uh, all model made, actually. The mouse was about maybe this long. Uh, it's a Mission Impossible mouse, obviously. This was all made. There are model makers who will make everything exactly as you want and, and be very specific. Um, again, not cheap. I think the mouse was £13,500 sterling. Um, yeah, I know. I mean, they had to put in every hair individually with the mouse just so as it looked real. But he does look, he does look good, actually. Um, he would need to look good. And then the whole set was about maybe six feet by about four feet. So it's really a still life shot at that stage. What happened to the mouse? Uh, the art director took him home. And <laughs> <laughs> art directors take everything. Get everything. Yeah. This is another model, actually. This was for uh, another whiskey client. And they, uh, it was coming up to Christmas, and what they wanted to do was to get this idea of a, of, of a, a nice little street and all the lights on. <clears throat> and they wanted to be within a city um, setting. And when you photograph something like this, you have to go to every house and get their permission, really. And it takes a lot of time, 
and we had found a street in Dublin city centre that worked really well and the location manager was off talking to everybody and at the last minute the client said no no we think it should be more of a rural um, setting and there just wasn't time to find somewhere and to photograph it so this is all a, a model <clears throat> it's about 14 feet long um, and all these these are again this is a guy in London who, who would have done this. this this is all salt down here all these little things the windows and doors are, are, are bought from Doll's House uh, suppliers and then we just put in a real sky and a little bit of this just to give it that and it's not bad really as a model it's not bad mm. uh, okay this is more uh, so I guess sort of straight photography um, a little bit of work done with color but more or less in camera and lit <clears throat> and I did a lot, I used to do a lot of this sort of work I used to work um, as Billy Bob Thornton uh, he came to Ireland with his band to play and again I used to do quite a lot of editorial work so I'd be called in again at the last minute really to go and photograph people um, he was a really nice guy I must say uh, very patient man um, Killian Murphy as a younger man um, he's 28 days later I think wasn't it the film uh, John Hurt and again a lot of these people will come there a lot of them are involved with plays um, around around uh, the UK and Ireland, so they will come over. John Hurt actually lives part time in Ireland. Uh, Neil Jordan, who's uh, the director, um, who did the Crying Game. I don't know if you've ever seen that film. Uh, John McSweeney, who's a who's a painter in Ireland, very well known painter. And again, this is all straight black and white work. This is just literally going out there, lighting it a little bit and into the dark room, fibre-based prints, that's it. And then just re-photographed. <clears throat> um, maybe some would be toned. I do used to do quite a lot of lith printing. Uh, this is blokes. This is just a little series I did just about men and how they sort of look. And again, I kept it really simple, just simple background, a little bit of styling for the, for the clothing. Um, and again, just concentrating on the lighting and trying to get the their personality coming out just with the lighting as much as anything else. Uh, this guy Vincent was actually a homeless um, man that somebody spotted and said he's got this most amazing face and he's really worth photographing so we, we brought him up to the studio for a day um, and it was <laughs> I mean it was quite sad really we photographed and we looked after him we gave him lunch we I gave him some money to sort of help him out um, and at the end of the day I said to him, you know, did you enjoy it today? And he said, I've never had so much attention spent to me, on me, for such a long time. Um, and I felt sort of quite bad. We had to, he was living in a homeless shelter and I just left him back there in the car. And you sort of think, well, it's not, a, not an easy life that he has. This is actually him again, <clears throat> with his hair down. And this is actually a, a plastic mask. Um, over his face, so you, you know, you wouldn't really, you can see his hair sort of tied in the bun. He was pretty cooperative, huh? Yeah, yeah. That was the stylist actually on the shoot suggested that we do this, and I wasn't sure about it at all, because I thought it gets to the edge of where you're asking people to do something that maybe they're not comfortable doing. But he was, he was fine, and he actually enjoyed the whole process. So how do you get work? As an advertising photographer, how do you get work? Your pictures are obviously the most important things, um, your portfolio. These days, your website really is also very, very important. I send out A5 cards a lot of the time, um, just to art directors, to ad agencies, to editorial clients. Just every couple of months, another little card arrives. I find that when you do emails to people, they just they don't want to look at them. They just, it's, it's almost like a harassment, constant emails, you know. So cards are better, they can, if they like them, they put them onto their wall. If they don't, they just put them into the bin. And persistence, persistence is the, is the real key to everything in photography. You've just got to keep at it and keep doing it. Whether it's taking the photographs or calling people or whatever, it's really persistence. And I don't know if anybody, is, anybody here is thinking of you know, moving into the sort of commercial advertising end of things. <clears throat> To be an assistant to a photographer really is a very, a very good way to start because uh, 
you get into work situations, you learn all about the shooting techniques and how uh, 3D work is done or whatever it might be that photographer specializes in. You know, and I really would say, if you are interested in it, go to New York, go to, any, go to LA, go to the big cities where these jobs happen, where money is spent on these jobs, because that's where you'll see the very top end. And once you've seen that, you can relate it back down. Um, and it's difficult to get jobs as assistants because lots of people want to be an assistant to a good advertising photographer. But again, that's your persistence, really. <clears throat> you go on trips, which are paid by somebody else. Uh, you earn a bit while you're working. And that's really the key, is to go and work with the best photographers. I mean, you're all very lucky here with Mike, because Mike is you know, a widely respected and very good photographer, and his influence will, will, will last all your lives. And it's the same with all of this sort of thing, that you really want to get in touch with the best people you can, um, because it, it just sets you up. Uh, for the rest of your life.